addition to all of the good work that Karen's conference today is going to be creating, uh, I owe her a personal debt because I got to come back to my home state of California. And I just wanted to address to the Californians some brief thoughts before I got into my main remarks. I grew up in San Francisco, both the city and the suburbs. And I have lived, I've never lived in a zip code where anyone agreed with me, ever. <laughs> um, so I've lived inside the liberal bubble. And I'll tell you the biggest change that I've noticed. 23 years ago, MSNBC first went on the air, and I and Ann Coulter were the first two analysts they hired on the conservative side of the spectrum. So MSNBC was not nearly as bad as it is today, but it was certainly tending in that direction. Already, its left hand couldn't decide what its extreme left hand was doing. But back in those days, at MSNBC, they believed in debate. You actually got, were hired by, by your ability to interact with the other side, present arguments, create heat, and you know, infotainment. Boy, have things changed. Several speakers yesterday commented the left does not want to debate anymore. They want to use names and slurs and hate speech to shut the debate down. And it's taken even uglier forms than it used to. I just came from the Conservative Party conference in Manchester, England, and William Reese Mogg, the leader of the House of Commons, the tall, bespectacled fellow who dresses in double-breasted suits invariably, had to have his speech moved because the venue uh, that he was going to be speaking at on the fringe of the conference, uh, received some protests and some threats, and um, they yanked the invitation less than 24 hours before his speech, so they had to scramble to a basement ballroom near the conference. So I come from that just three days ago to here, and what do I read in the Daily Coast? Well, a description of a conference that may take place on some alternative planet, but certainly not this one. Uh, although some of the names are recognizable, like poor Karen. <laughs> and what is the, I, I read this article, and since the fellow hadn't been here and hadn't read anything of the works of any of the people here, what was he writing about? The whole article was a disguised effort to intimidate the owners of this hotel and make sure they never, that you never meet in this town again, effectively. I mean, the owners of this hotel, I learned from this, are an Iraqi Jewish family that fled Saddam Hussein. And they appreciate freedom. They appreciate the opportunity that America has created for them. And the only crime they're guilty of is being willing to rent out their meeting space and sell breakfast and lunch to people who want to discuss ideas. But this... This writer went into detail on their real estate transactions, their net worth, their immigration status, where their family lives. I mean, it, it really did feel like something Orwellian. Because it basically was a warning shot. I suspect there'll be another article after this conference going directly after them, now that they know this conference has been held. And I think one of the priorities of this conference, because I know you meet here on other topics, is to make sure this gets shut down and to expose them for what they're doing, which is, it starts out with intimidation. There may be protests out there today. The next thing you know, there will be threats and perhaps threats of violence. Who knows? That has to stop. And we have to be people who not only meet here, but who defend this place of meeting. So. Almost everyone here has spoken better than I and with more knowledge of the scene in their country than I can. So I'll try to give you a couple of thoughts. Um, the lessons I've learned that I think apply to at least the discussion of Europe here come from first a Nobel Prize winning economist and secondly a 
14-year-old girl. I'll get there. <laughs> in the 1980s, when I was working in Washington, I got to meet once the great free market economist, Friedrich Hayek. And he spoke at the Cato Institute, and he had a seminar for the young people there afterwards. I'll never forget the conversation. I only wish I had taped it. And one of the things that he said that impressed me greatly was this. He said, from long observation and study, he concluded, even though I am not a religious man, I have concluded that every successful religion in the world ratifies and holds true to certain values. And they include a respect for the family, a respect for private property, a respect for treating the rights of others as equals. And there are certain standards that they meet, certain values. They may have other faults, but on basic fundamental principles, they agree. And he said, even though I am not religious, thank God for religion, because I have concluded, watching the left around the world, that if people do not believe in religion, they will believe in anything. And is that not true today? The secular, the secular substitutions for the established religions are the gods of diversity. Greta. Climate change. Oh, which used to be global warming until the global warming stopped and they had to rebrand. I have a story about that later. Uh, there is no limit to what people will believe if they're not anchored in their traditions, their country, their family, and their faith. There is no limit to what they will believe. We see that in the attacks on us. So I carried that with me in 1984, that year of Orwell, on a trip to East Germany. Um, I grew up a little bit in Germany. My father was working for the Air Force and then for RCA. I had, some, I had conversational, still have conversational knowledge of German. But I went across the Berlin Wall into East Berlin with a friend of mine from the US Embassy, who was German, a German employee there, and spoke completely fluent German. We decided to go to the Museum of German History. And it was an amazing place. You learn things there you'd never learn anywhere else. I learned that television had been invented by an East German. Um, it was still black and white in some cases, but it was there. No. And so we were walking through this hallway. I think we were somewhere between the Franco-Prussian War and World War I. And four little girls came up to us. They were 13 or 14 years old. And they stopped us and asked us what time it was, which was interesting because two of them were wearing watches. And uh, it seemed strange because there was a clock above our head. And obviously, they wanted to make conversation. It turned out there were four girls from the provinces, and they were there in school day, school trip, for, to see their capital. And we were the first Westerners they'd ever met. So curious, I asked them, how did you know we were from the West? And they said, we looked at your shoes. They weren't made of plastic. <laughs> and we were chatting there, and suddenly their teacher showed up. Now, I don't want to go into a long description of her, but think Nurse Ratchet and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> she said it was time to go. And they said, oh, no, we're scheduled for another 45 minutes at the museum. And she said it was time to go. We obviously were a subversive influence on these young minds. So they left. And we went on our tour of the city, my friend and I. And we ended up at uh, Centrum Warenhouse, the big department store in East Berlin. What was it like? Think Kmart without much inventory. <laughs> and by the way, nothing in there could be bought if you didn't live in East Berlin. If you were outside of East Berlin, you could shop, but you couldn't buy. And if you weren't from East Berlin, there was a waiting list. But that's another story. We were walking through Central Barn House, and suddenly the girls were there again. Complete coincidence. Their teacher had decided this was a great time, since she was a party member, to go shopping in East Berlin, because she could go to those currency stores, the Consum, I think they were called? The Consum? Yes. That's where you could use Western currency and other currencies to buy things you couldn't get otherwise. So she let the girls go. 
So we decided, since we actually knew the city better than they did, we decided to give them their tour of their capital. So we took them around, bought them ice cream, sat down. Uh, I showed them my American passport. They showed me their identity papers. Uh, we had a great time. I learned a lot about life in uh, rural East Germany. And then it was coming on nightfall. So it was obviously time for us to think about heading back west to our hotel. My hotel, his home in West Berlin, my friends. And we walked towards Friedrichstrasse station where the uh, wall was and the transit point going back. I'll never forget, they had never seen the wall at that point. They had arrived in East Berlin, but they hadn't been to the wall. So, but instinctively they knew they were walking towards it. So we started walking more slowly each step towards the wall, and finally we turned the corner and there it was, you know, 75 yards ahead, and they stopped and said, it's probably better that we not go any further. Who knows, but I might ask us questions why we're here, especially with two of you foreigners here. So I stood there on that street corner in East Berlin, and I'll never forget how sad, how in in inevitably sad I was. I could go, I was not wealthy, I had a few hundred dollars in my checking account then, but I could take that money and I could travel anywhere in the world from that street corner. They couldn't go another 75 yards. They were in a giant adult zoo. People could come and visit them, people could feed them, bring them stuff from KDV in West Berlin, the big department store, but they could not leave. So I stood there, and just to keep the conversation going, I asked each of the four of them what they wanted to be when they grew up. And I'll never forget, let's see, one was wanted to be a beautician, one wanted to be a nurse, one wanted to be a teacher. But the oldest and the wisest was Monica, and Monica looked at me with these very sad, soulful eyes. I'll never forget them, and she said, you know, it really doesn't matter what we want to be when we grow up. No matter what we become, we will always be treated as children. And my heart just sank. So after a few more fumbled words, we left. I got their addresses. And for the next three or four years or so, I would send Monica and the others a postcard, sometimes from California. They were very interested in California. And kept in touch for spasmodically. And then November 1989 arrived. We're in October 19, 2019, so we're approaching the 30th anniversary next month. And I'll never forget, I was sitting in my office in New York at the Wall Street Journal, and the news came across the wires that the Berlin Wall had fallen. And of course that night we could watch those incredible scenes playing out on our televisions, I'm sure you remember them. And I had to ask myself, I just wonder, Monica is somewhere in that crowd. So the next morning, I was woken up, six hour time difference, and what had happened was, the entrepreneurial spirit of West German firms, even the telephone company Monopoly was very apparent. Overnight, they had set up little kiosks at the border crossing points saying, this is your future, the telephone. <laughs> Most church Germans didn't have one. And free call anywhere in the world right now. Free call. So the phone rings and I pick up the phone and the words I hear, the first words I hear are, John, this is Monica, I'm over the wall. Well, I was over the moon with the news at that point. And we talked three, four, five minutes. And I remember at the end of the conversation, I sort of teased her because I said, at that street corner in East Berlin, you had told me no matter what we become, you will never, never be treated as an adult. You'll always be treated as a child. And I said, do you still think that's the case? And she was quick on her feet. She was by now, I think, 19. And she immediately said, I think my country has graduated from kindergarten to high school overnight. 
And I said, well, you know, I'm obviously this is my area of expertise. I will be in Europe soon. I hope we can connect. And I suspect I won't have much trouble crossing the border. <laughs> well, it turns out that, yes, that did change Monica's life. Uh, she had been very rebellious in gymnasium and high school, and uh, she was denied entrance to the university. Uh, her goal was to be a veterinarian, and she eventually did go to school, became a veterinarian, married, had kids, and um, has been very successful. But I saw her, I think it was 18 months ago, and we reminisced about the conversation and what has happened since. She said something very interesting because, of course, the whole Brexit issue was alive, the rise of the AFD in Germany, Merkel's migration policy, all of that. And we talked about that, and she said, you know, John, it's very interesting. I remember thinking that the East German government would never allow us to grow up and would always treat us as children. And I'm thinking now that that's sort of what the EU government is doing to us, letting us never grow up and always treating us as children who can't be trusted. Because somehow, if we are allowed to have our own nation states and conduct our own affairs, we're going to automatically become savages and go to war with each other again. As if we're people who need to be caged up in an adult zoo again. Well. I'm not here to speak for any political party or any political movement. I'll just note two things. Monica now votes for the AFD. And I, I have many German relatives. My mother was German. Um, she grew up in Heidelberg. And uh, she went to an English-speaking high school even during World War II. Uh, she briefly became a translator for General Patton after the war. Sadly, after 17 days, he had a very bad driver. So she was his translator for 17 days. But my relatives who stayed behind in Germany, we all be they all became one of two things, either engineers or social workers. Engineers or social workers. Uh, sort of like two halves of the brain. Well, the social worker side of my family in Germany has always voted SPD, always voted for the Social Democrats or even the Greens. And I was visiting them with them just two months ago, and in whispers they told me, last time we voted for the AFD. And I said, and I said, why do you agree with all of their policies? And they said, no, but the bosses need a kick in the pants. And the bosses today are not the bosses in the company, they're the bosses in Berlin and in Brussels. So things are happening over there, just as they're happening here. As they say on the other side of the ideological divide, this is no accident, comrade. <laughs> I will just tell you my observation both of the US and Europe and how this has happened. We have been fighting battles day to day and fighting short-term rear guard actions all the time, while underneath us, the public education system in both Europe and the United States has been undermining all of the values that we hold dear. I'm writing a book right now on citizenship in the United States, how we no longer revere it, no longer talk about it, certainly no longer teach it. Do any of the people here who have children or grandchildren, do any of them learn civics or U.S. history or about our founding fathers in school anymore? God bless Temecula. But, but it's not common. I think there is a conscious, real effort on the part of the left to, to paraphrase the Ronald Reagan quote we heard yesterday, they know that if our values and our freedom and our American exceptionalism are not transmitted uh, by us directly, they're not going to be transmitted through the bloodstream. They will be lost. And I think they are hollowing out our public education system on purpose to make sure that our children and grandchildren don't remember why this country is special. And the same can be said of European nations and their traditions 
and their honorable history and their accomplishments and their exceptionalism. So that's our challenge. I actually believe, and I know that there are people in this room who will disagree with me, I actually believe in the short run, we're winning. Their internal contradictions are finally becoming exposed to all, to all who wish to look and to all who wish to see, which is not a majority, but it's building towards one, and I refer you to recent developments, whether they're in Britain or the United States or some other countries. But in the long run, I'm more pessimistic because as we've heard from other speakers like Daniel Hannon, in the short term, things don't matter. Things are cyclical. We have to look for a long-term commitment on the part of each coming generation to the values that made Western civilization our savior. And if we don't ensure that long-term transmission belt, the short-term tactical victories and the embarrassments that we cause the left when we expose their most ridiculous ideas will be for naught. So I think the challenge that we have today has to be twofold. We have to continue the short-term battle, and I think we're getting better and better at that. And we have to figure out a way, some way, to communicate to our children and grandchildren what there is to preserve, what there is to revere what there is to cherish, what it means to be a patriot. Thank you very much.